Um, so we will start with you, Jessica, for introductions. If you could um, share about who you are and describe your journey of becoming a cooperative abolitionist um, and how has that shaped what cooperatives and abolition mean to you? Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Um, I too want to acknowledge the original stewards of the land. I think I'm on Lenape land at the moment. Um, I also want to bring my ancestors into the room with us and remember those enslaved, those who continue to labor without just compensation, recognizing the struggles as Abe uh, reminded us and a day, uh, the struggles of all those combating anti-Black racism, patriarchy, police brutality, Let's acknowledge the movement for Black Lives um, and all of our work for um, environmental justice and real uh, the end of exploitation. So Jessica Gordon Emhart is my name. I'm a political economist, professor of community justice and social economic development in the Department of Africana Studies at John Jay College, which is part of City University of New York. I'm a mother and a grandmother. I'm the author of a book called Collective Courage, a history of African-American cooperative economic thought and practice. I'm a co-op educator and a co-op activist, um, as well as a social activist. Um, to get to the core of the question, why am I a cooperative abolitionist? Um, Partly, it's because um, I was raised by social activists and continue to believe that um, we need to be we need to be the transform we need to transform the society because it's not the kind of society that human beings should live in. And as I started talking, researching about how to use cooperatives for community economic development, and then uh, became an expert expert in the Black co-op movement and African American cooperatives, uh, the next frontier for looking at co-ops and marginality is to look at co-ops in uh, with incarcerated people in prisons and how to use co-ops for community-based approaches to justice. And so, the last few years. I've focused on looking at justice involved people and how co-ops can work with them and what we can do to uh, abolish the prison industrial complex. And I can talk about that more in the next question. Thank you. Thank you so much, glad to have you here. And we'll move right along to, yes, you, Ed. Hi, uh, thank you all so much for inviting me. I'm Ed Whitfield. <clears throat> I'm here in um, Clarksdale, Mississippi now. I used to be many years in North Carolina, even though I was born in Arkansas. Um, what all of these places have in common is that they were places from whom the indigenous um, stewards of the land were forcibly and murderously removed um, over a period of hundreds of years. Um, but most recently, where I am now is a place where um, in 18, 30, in September of 1830, there was signed the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek that led to the removal of tens of thousands of uh, Choctaw people from 11 million acres of land that was then later developed as part of the plantation system in the, uh, in the Deep South. 11 million acres of land that people were forced off of and forced to walk into what was called Indian Territory um, to settle on land that had also been stolen from some other uh, Native Americans. It's amazing how the U.S. government was able to trade land that they stole from one group of people uh, to somebody else and then um, remove them in that way. This was the first, the Dancing Rabbit Creek was the first treaty that was actually putting into effect the Indian Removal Act. Um, so this is a very historic place. Uh, and the legacy of that tragedy continues with us with the gigantic land holdings that I can see all around me where pieces of that 11 million acres of land ended up um, settling into the plantation class 
that uh, had a whole bunch of land and a bunch of folk living on the land desperately before the Civil War. And then after the Civil War, they had a whole bunch of land and a bunch of folk living precariously on that land as well. So not all evidence changed. And uh, the prison abolition thing just makes it very clear that the 13th Amendment guaranteed as it was written that the, the folk in power really weren't done with slavery yet. Um, and so the slavery that maintains itself and is enshrined in the 13th Amendment is part of the unfinished business of abolitionists. Um, and, and I consider myself to be a part of that. It's so fascinating. Once I was listening to a study done by Brown University of Brown's participation in um, slavery and the slave trade. And it became very, very clear that while slavery was physically concentrated in the South at the point, um, follow, particularly following the abolition of the trading that was going on, that the North was intimately involved in the overall slave system by virtue of um, manufactured goods. They made chains, they made shoes, they made all kinds of things to serve the slave, uh, the, the, the world of enslavement and the plantation economy in the South. And I began to think to myself, it was like, how did people do this? It's like, how could people be blind to the incredible injustice? And I asked, well, I wonder, are there similar injustices around me now that people are almost similarly blind to? And it immediately became clear that the US prison system was such a thing where we almost tell jokes about the ongoing rape and degradation of humans behind these bars as though the humans who are, are, are trapped in those places are fundamentally different from the normal humans who end up serving as prison guards and as corrupt politicians and all of the other criminal elements that we're surrounded with daily who are not behind those bars. And it became very, very clear to me that, uh, that we have to collectively create the institutions that replace and abolish that institution once and for all. And that our, our proclivity toward developing cooperative solutions should move us one toward creating financial and economic structures that help prevent anyone having been in, in the sense of desperation that leads them to some of the activities that get people into prison, including innocent activities like drug trading that's uh, way illegal for no particularly good reasons, uh, as well as even other kinds of things. But we have to create community institutions to replace that. We have to create community opportunities for the people who are locked up in, and trapped in that system. So as they get out, they can become the full participating uh, members of the community that they need to be and build the democracy that we deserve, that is humane in the ways that we deserve. And I think that it's rooted in the kinds of, of economic development that the cooperative movement represents. Thank you so much. Um, Esteban? Hi. Um, I'm excited to be here too. And, and thank you, Ed, um, for, I think it's really important that we um, not sanitize the brutal history of, of uh, settler colonialism. Um, so I, I very much appreciate Ed bringing that um, front and center. I'm, I'm beaming in from Lenny Lenape land. I grew up in Lenape land um, known as New York and I was born and raised there my people come from uh, Arawak land in, in the Caribbean, and I'm, I'm now on Lenape land, Len Len land in Philadelphia. And it's really exciting to me to see the indigenous names of, of all the places I've lived, um, like people beaming in from Ohlone and Washtenaw land and um, all parts of, of the world. Um, I should say a couple of things about introduction, and then I'm really interested in digging into this question about abolition. Um, and it's interesting that we have the the pleasure of having this conversation together because we've um, many of us as colleagues and cooperative organizers have had a lot of com conversations about um, our futures, about reparations, about cooperative development, about black liberation. And this question undergirds that and is is so rarely given the central place that it needs when we're when we're envisioning. Um, our futures. So yeah, my name is Esteban or Esteban. Um, and I am a cooperative 
organizer, uh, an educator, not just a cooperative educator, but a political educator. Um, and one of the, you see probably in the Zoom, one of my affiliations is with uh, a worker co-op that I co-founded uh, in 2010 after the US Social Forum called AORTA, which stands for Anti-Oppression Resource and Training Alliance. And um, I also am the executive director for the US Federation of Worker Co-ops. And um, those are uh, those are two of my political homes um, as my workplaces, my primary workplaces. But of course, um, so much of my abolition work is outside of, of those places, less so with Aorta. I think we've done more of it around political education and, and resourcing the groups that are on the front lines of um, raising consciousness and awareness about abolition work or um, that are actively actively doing this, like actively decarcerating. Um, and in fact, I couldn't possibly enter this conversation without giving a shout out to my my dear friend, comrade, and co-founder of Aorta, uh, Lydia Pello Hobbs, who left, I think, a year ago today, <laughs> who, who transitioned from Aorta and is now a professor. Um, her scholarship is exactly around this work of abolition. Um, she is based in um, New Orleans in, in the South, and um, and is the, the um, in my time as a graduate student at the City University of New York, um, I, I actually started there studying capitalism and eventually racial capitalism um, and then recruited Lydia to come on in uh, shortly after Ruth Wilson Gilmore had, had come to CUNY. So I actually started there as a student of David Harvey um, and the late Neil Smith with these questions about racial capitalism. Um, and then Ruthie came and it was like, this is the place to be studying this. And, um, and I, I brought Lydia into that work too. And so, so Aorta is one of the ways in which people might have known about some of my fingerprints on abolitionist work and organizing and, and um, not just theory, but specifically praxis. Um, and I wanna maybe call in some of the other work that I've done about this because my grounding in it is not at all from the cooperative side, actually. And I don't know how much that, that gets um, brought into to our stories of, of particularly this community. Um, and that's why it's a joy to me to, to be able to put those things together in this conversation today. Um, I mean, back back in my deeper organizing history, I've, I've been doing this work through critical, from supporting groups like Critical Resistance, um, the uh, Anarchist Black Cross in the US, in Brazil with uh, Cruz Negra Anarquista, it's the same name, just in Portuguese, um, in my organizing down in Sao Paulo. Um, and uh, I already mentioned my work at the CUNY Graduate Center, uh, more recently supporting along with Ed and, and others, um, the Movement for Black Lives um, and some of that, that sort of angle around what this work looks like. Um, and, uh, and locally in Philly, groups like Decarcerate PA and um, uh, Books Through Bars um, that, is working directly to just be in community and resourcing and supporting people who are locked in cages. But over all of that, I mean, my deepest work around abolition and, and community accountability and transformative justice is through a collective that I was part of, volunteer collective um, for 15, 16 years now, um, 10 of which were really intensely focused on, on organizing around transformative justice processes. It was called um, is was eh, we're not we're not as active these days, but we haven't disbanded entirely. The Philly Stands Up Collective, and um, we worked um, very very small collective that worked specifically in holding people accountable who had caused harm in sexual assault situations, um, and and in doing so sharpening our analysis of what it even like what even is harm and what is accountability um and and we didn't start that work didn't even start with um a refutation of the carceral system it started with being rooted in our community and meeting the needs of the survivors that were in our community and then it turned out that we needed to um just get closer and put the work in really roll up our sleeves not just to support the survivors, but that the people who, has, who had caused harm 
them they, that that actually takes labor that that takes emotional labor to support their work in being accountable and understanding their transgressions um and uh and accompanying them and sometimes that meant that we were doing work around um substance abuse or harm reduction or um some of the other things that i'm sure we'll get into later but um just wanted to call in like that that is my my background really around abolition work is through this collective that actually we started in 2004 and it was before the term transformative justice had been coined by Generation Five, and of course, they had also been doing this work for for a long time. So, those are some of my political homes that I'm sort of bringing in um, to the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much, and please, Morning Star. Shemisanui, Morning Star Gali, Elikatige Chi, Maajumawi is Chi. My name is Morning Star Galley. I am Ajumawi Band of Pitt River. I am currently on the lands of the Nishinan, Maidu, and Miwok peoples. Um, we just held an event last night, actually, um, here in Sacramento, California, at Sutter's Fort, um, abolition with an indigenous framework. And it was very powerful to hold the event um, at Sutter's Fort, in the rain, uh, in the dark, and to talk about the need for dismantling the carceral system that is known as the United States Empire. Um, and Sutter's Fort, for those that, that are not, may not be aware, Sutter's Fort represents the um, capital of, of genocide for California indigenous peoples, the epitome of genocide. And, and so holding the event there um, and being able to just share our stories and um, share some space with folks without any sort of permissions from anyone um, was just very powerful and very healing. I will share that my um, introduction into cooperatives and my introduction into abolition work um, was really something that I was physically born into. Uh, my father was incarcerated at San Quentin State Penitentiary for seven years. Uh, he was, um, he served seven years for his involvement with Third World Liberation Front movements. And from his release, he, him and my mom were living in the AIM house in Oakland, the AIM for Freedom Survival School. And so that's where I was born. And so having this collectiveness and this this community, <clears throat> excuse me, this community space where uh, we did not rely on on the police and on policing, but very much had an understanding of what it was to be in community and to look out for one another um, is something that I have tried to recreate um, throughout throughout decades within our own communities and um, and try to to replicate and knowing that um, there is an interdependency and that is a value system that it is something that we are familiar with um, and not this individualistic um, framework that capitalism um, is constantly um, revealing that that we are are continuing to fail at. So I, I'll stop there and thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with all of you. We ride, we 